Uh, welcome. I remind us that after the lecture, there will be a short break with refreshments and then the question period in the junior common room directly behind us. I am pleased to introduce our lecturer this afternoon. Gabe Pihas is a graduate of this college, class of 93. He earned postgraduate degrees in medieval studies at Yale University and then completed a doctorate at the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago, writing on the roots of the modern novel in Dante and Cervantes, among others. He has been a fellow at the American Academy in Rome, has taught at the European College of Liberal Arts in Berlin, now Bard College Berlin, has been on the faculty of St. John's College in Annapolis, and is now a tutor in the inter integral program of liberal arts at St. Mary's College in California, a great books program with strong ties to St. John's. He is also the founder and current director of the Rome Institute of Liberal Arts, a summer study abroad program that, since its inaugural summer in 2008, has been extremely beneficial to the St. John's community. Over 75 St. John's students have completed the program, together with many students from other institutions, and over 15 of our tutors have been teaching faculty or lecturers in the program. I note in this connection that Mr. Pihas is offering a second talk tomorrow at 3.15 in the Junior Common Room on Greek and Roman art, which will explore some of the themes, texts, and art studied at the Rome Institute. That talk will be open to all and presupposes no special background, either in art history or in Hegel's philosophy of art, which provides the framework of the talk. Among many other interests, Mr. Pihas has been an avid reader and student of Dante, as I can attest, since writing his sophomore and senior essays at St. John's. He has published articles on Dante and nihilism, Dante's Ulysses, the theme of today's talk, Dante and Greek philosophy, and most recently, Dante's Beatrice, Between Idolatry and Iconoclasm, to be published in the St. John's Review this spring. I might also add that he is married to an Italian woman named Francesca, <laughs> thereby inscribing in his own life the cadences of some of Dante's most beautiful and tragic poetry of love in Canto V of the Inferno, however, to a much, much happier conclusion than that of Dante's unfortunate lovers. I am particularly grateful to have the opportunity to introduce Mr. Pihas for his first lecture on this campus, as I count him one of my oldest and dearest friends. We met just days, if not hours, into our freshman year at St. John's, and our friendship, first nourished on the Velvet Underground and Minor Threat, eventually deepened through long hours translating Aeschylus and Plato and reading Hegel and Heidegger together paragraph by paragraph. May everyone be blessed with philosophical friendships in which the friends take the same things most seriously, but disagree deeply about those very things. Just so, Gabe and I have argued interminably about first things in Santa Fe and Annapolis, Chicago and Berlin, Rome, Florence, Perugia and Pordenone, New York, New Haven and San Francisco, and like Dante's sinners, we have proven basically incorrigible against our attempts to reform one another. Mr. Piazza's talk today is entitled Dante's Ulysses. Please join me in welcoming Gabe Piazza. Thank you, Walter, for, uh, of all the people to meet in your first days of freshman year, uh, I was very lucky that Walter Sterling is, uh, uh, is, is, was, is an amazing person, and I, I was uh, very fortunate to run into him. He was, I should get this in, he was trying to dissect a turtle in his first days of freshman lab, and he and his lab partner spent weeks trying to saw through the shell. and. You, they never did, and the report was about how the shell was a defensive feature. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so, um, I'm going to hold this here. The lighting is a little bit funny. But, uh, 
so, uh, so I just want to thank him for the invitation to speak here also. And just, uh, he's, he, I, I owe him so much and I think he's, I'm so proud of him for all he's done for, for the college as a tutor and as dean and continuing here for the college. Um, so I'm very fortunate that he's my friend. Um, okay. Uh, there are three limits to human nature that Dante has in mind in the canto that I'll discuss, Inferno 26. The first limit depends on considering man as a political animal. This consideration suggests that a human being must be part of a community. The second limit to human nature is personal mortality. Human life on earth is finite. Third limit is epistemological and is particular to premises from thinkers of Dante's time and place. According to a medieval argument, we cannot know separate substances such as intelligences and God without the help of divine grace. If we go beyond these three limits, if we go beyond community, mortality, and the limit on knowledge of separated substances, our way of life becomes very different. Going beyond community would mean that moral obligations would be of reduced or no value. We would use any means necessary to overcome the obstacles we meet in the world. Going beyond mortality would mean overcoming death through human striving, through individual fame, or through the power of the human intellect. If we knew separate substances in this life, we would have complete happiness on earth and no need for salvation or heaven. In Dante's Ulysses, we meet someone who ignores these three constraints on human nature. He stops at nothing in political life. He stops at nothing in exploration as he sails past the limits of the human world in his old age. I will clarify his character by looking carefully at the text and the sources for portrayal in Inferno 26. Although I will mention all of the three limits because they all come up in the canto, I am most interested in mortality and community and especially the latter. As I suggest, it is the problem of community that is most interesting to us of the three and it has the most importance also in the canto. The Roman poet Virgil had depicted Odysseus as a treacherous liar and as the foil to the pious founder of Rome, Aeneas. Dante never read Homer and guided by Virgil and other Roman authors, he found it natural to imagine a Ulysses close to the bottom of hell. In the Inferno, he stands among a group of sinners traditionally known as the fraudulent counselors, whose intellectual gifts bring them to disaster. They are punished for counseling the use of unjust means that appear expedient but are dishonorable. Ulysses is a master of dissimulation in both word and deed, as well as an explorer. As a counselor, as a master of, of speech, and as an explorer, he resembles Dante himself. Hence, in the explorer rhetorician Ulysses, the pilgrim poet Dante encounters his own distorted likeness. Thus, the episode in Canto 26 turns out to be central to understanding the risk of Dante's poetic journey and prophetic mission in the Divine Comedy. Traces of Ulysses are everywhere in the book. Dante suggests his likeness to Ulysses prospectively, even before the reader encounters Ulysses, from the very first canto, where we meet Dante recovering from a shipwreck just like that of Ulysses. Allusions to Ulysses continued throughout the Purgatorio and the Paradiso. Of all the sinners in hell, only Ulysses gets such extensive attention. Dante's sustained reflection on a negative image of himself is a way for him to pursue self-knowledge, just as Socrates pursues self-knowledge in considering his impoverished doubles, as for example, when he considers his own resemblance to the sophist or in talking with Phaedrus about his love of Logoi. Dante, however, is more at risk than Socrates. When he first sees Ulysses, he nearly falls into the pit in which he's being punished. And this is the first thing on the handout that I have. Um, I leaned up above the bridge erect to see so that if I hadn't grabbed the jutting rock, I would have fallen down without being pushed. Dante is overcome by vertigo and curiosity. His description of the sinners almost makes us fall in too. Together, Dante and the reader must witness his pagan predecessor's death in order to understand the evil of his predecessor. More exactly, Dante must see where Ulysses lost when to die. This is the question that we're asking. Where, where did he go to die when he was lost? 
To see the resemblance of Dante and Ulysses, let me begin with Ulysses' speech. This is the second thing on your handout. O oh, brothers, who through a hundred thousand dangers have reached the West, to this brief wakefulness left to our senses, do not wish to deny experience following the track of the sun in the world without people. Consider your seed. You were not made to live as brutes, but to follow virtue and knowledge. The original of the speech is elegant. Fatti non foste a vivere come bruti, ma perseguir virtute e conoscenza. This phrase, virtue and knowledge, indicates the resemblance to Dante with which we must come to grips. Dante used the same phrase positively in his in unfinished philosophical work, The Convivio. Here is the quote from there. It's the third thing on your handout. The true gift which this book offers is to lead men to virtue and knowledge. Dante, like Ulysses, wishes to pursue exactly virtue and knowledge. Do Dante and Ulysses resemble each other because Dante at one time was Ulysses? Or even worse, at bottom still is Ulysses. Some think Dante ultimately admired Ulysses, either intentionally or despite himself. This has been articulated by critics in a number of ways. Some say that Dante is a crypto-heretic, secretly a radical Aristotelian and not a Christian. Others divide the canto into two parts. In the first part, we learn of Ulysses' sin, which is subterfuge in war, while the second part of his journey has nothing to do with that subterfuge. For these critics, Ulysses' sin of deceit does not diminish his intellectual virtue in the second part, which we can and should still admire. While his deceit in war was really a sin, the only error of his journey beyond the pillars of Hercules was to live after Christian revelation. Hence, for these readers, his death and his punishment are really either a tragedy or a divine injustice against which we must rebel. I will argue for a different reading than either of these. Um, Dante did have a Ulyssean moment in which he thought to find consolation for mortality through philosophy without grace. This is represented by his shipwreck in Canto I. But by the time he writes the comedy, he is rejecting Ulysses' root and branch. By educating himself about Ulysses in this canto, by the, the character becoming educated about Ulysses in this canto, he becomes a true prophet. Dramatizing Dante the character's shipwreck in Canto I and his initial vertigo before Ulysses in Canto 26 is a sign of total self-control in Dante the author. I will articulate how he separates himself from Ulysses while also giving an account for why the resemblance between himself and Ulysses is worth emphasizing. The resemblance has to do with the virtue of prudence. As I said, these sinners are known as fraudulent counselors because of a phrase that's used in Canto 27 uh, with the other person in this pit, Guido da Montefeltro. He is identified as being a fraudulent counselor. Um, and so the, uh, the, this spills over to the other canto. For the Middle Ages, to call their sin the sin of counsel links it to prudence. I will argue that a resemblance between prudence and a similar but vicious use of the intellect underlies the whole canto. The resemblance between prudence and its evil double derives from a medieval interpretation of Plato and Aristotle. This vicious use of intellect that is opposed to prudence includes not only subterfuge in war, but also the vice of curiositas, or a prideful use of intellect. Curiosity and a deformation of prudence are sometimes offered as two alternative accounts of Ulysses' sin. As I will suggest towards the end of the lecture, in medieval philosophy, they are really the same thing. Dante took up the issue of prudence from Aristotle. The parallels that I'll raise with Plato and Aristotle, of course, should not obscure a fundamental disagreements between them and Dante about the best life and about the importance of reason and philosophy. Dante participates little in the life of theoretical inquiry for its own sake, and instead seems chiefly interested in morals. Any metaphysical or epistemological speculation that he engages in is always mixed up with revealed theology. As a Christian, he saw complete fulfillment of human intellectual aspiration as possible only through grace, and so he would have appeared to Plato and Aristotle to be living in the cave of the civil religion. In contrast, for Plato and Aristotle, the philosopher practices virtues that the city does not recognize, and the philosopher lives above the city. So for them, it becomes a real question whether the philosopher will even concern himself with the city at all. For Dante, however, there is no tension between philosophy and the city. Instead, the philosopher is the very perfection of the city, or nature. 
What is above the human city and nature is the heavenly city and grace. Dante's radicalism is not to point beyond the city to philosophy, but instead to turn our attention back down to the earthly city and back down to philosophy in the midst of medieval religious culture that always looks towards the transcendent. But Ulysses marks the limit of his new interest in nature. So I'm going to first sketch out um, uh, Dante's sources for this idea of prudence and explain where, where it's coming from. Let me begin with a book that Dante never read, uh, but which I submit to you is the ultimate source for this canto. Uh, in book six of the Republic, Socrates discusses the role of philosophers in society. Not surprisingly, he says that a natural aptitude for philosophy is the best thing in itself and is the source for the greatest things. But he also says something that is rather surprising. Socrates says that a philosophical nature is a double-edged sword, sometimes extremely valuable and sometimes extremely harmful. Those with the best natures become exceptionally bad when they receive a bad education. When corrupted, it is the very philosophic nature that leads individuals astray in their own life and it also destroys the community in which they live. So there's a quote now from the Republic, which is on your handout, which is basically saying what I just said, but I'll just go through it. The very parts that go to make up a philosophical nature when they turn up in a bad upbringing are in a certain way the cause of one's falling away from the pursuit of philosophy. And those who wreck the greatest havoc on their cities and on private people come particularly from among these men. And so do those who do the greatest good if they happen to be drawn that way. Socrates will describe a way to draw the philosophical nature towards the good in the course of his account of the cave in Book 7. To preserve the soul that has the philosophical nature from corruption, one must turn the soul around and direct the eye of the soul towards the light. The perspective must be reversed. Although the effect of such a turning is a, literally a total conversion or total revolution, this education does not need to put, on, put any new power of vision into the soul. This power Socrates here calls uh, something that belongs to the virtue of prudence. Its power is the same whether it leads us to evil or to good. So um, I'll read again from the handout, Socrates' account of prudence and conversion. This is a passage that I think will be very familiar to most of you. I've compressed some of the exchanges in this, in this quotation. Uh, this power, the instrument with which each man learns, just like an eye, would not be able to turn around the, toward the light from the dark without the whole body also. This power must be turned around. And the virtue of prudence never loses power, but depending on the way it's turned, it becomes useful and helpful, or again, useless and harmful. Or haven't you reflected on the men who are said to be vicious but wise, how shrewdly their petty soul sees and how sharply it distinguishes those things towards which it is turned, showing that it doesn't have poor vision, although it is compelled to serve vice so that the sharper it sees, the more evil it accomplishes. I'll look at Ulysses and Dante as representing the power of the eye of the soul directed in two different directions, towards the darkness and towards the light. They both exercise the power of what Plato calls prudence, but one is virtuous while the other is merely shrewd and vicious. Through this meeting, we witness Dante's Christian moralized version of the Platonic image, the turning around of his soul. As in the Platonic context, we will see that for Dante, the direction in which the eye of the soul is turned has an effect not just on the individual soul, but on the whole city in, in, where that soul lives. Without the conversion, the philosophical nature can destroy both the individual and the city. Dante, again, never read the Republic. However, in Dante's philosophical work, The Convivio, in the precise chapter where Dante takes his first stab at the issues in the Ulysses Canto, Dante cites a discussion from the Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle in which Aristotle references this precise passage in the Republic. Hence, there is an indirect and unconscious but a very unambiguous link between Dante and the concept in, the, in this part of the Republic. What is interesting and makes it worth dwelling on it is that although Dante gets the issue from Aristotle, he recreates some of the Platonic context that's not in the passage from Aristotle. So he's on, and uh, so it, there's so there's no evidence that he ever saw the Republic, but it just looks like he was able to supply some things that you know, just by thinking about it. Um, the Aristotle in question is something the freshman just read in seminar last night, so uh, I think that's that's good. So I'll uh, 
I'll turn to that now. So uh, in book six of the ethics, Ar uh, Aristotle talks about the intellectual virtues and at the end, he suddenly questions the value of intellectual virtues. Uh, why, is, why are these things of any use at all? Might we not be better off as unreflective, conventional, but good people? Why bother thinking so much about virtue? Aristotle concedes that knowledge about virtue doesn't necessarily make one able to do virtuous things. But he makes two arguments in favor of intellectual virtues. First, he says that wisdom, in a certain sense, is already the same as happiness. Wisdom is a part of complete virtue and makes a person happy by being possessed and at work. Hence, for Aristotle, moral virtues are less than wisdom, which seems to be happiness here. But there are suggestions that the higher kind of happiness is either difficult or impossible if the human being who has it is divorced from moral virtue. Even the philosopher lives among human beings and at the very least will require some moral virtue in order to get along with the people around him in order to maintain intellectual activity. A second defense for the intellectual virtues that Aristotle goes on to make suggests a potentially more robust connection between moral and intellectual virtues. And it is this second argument that's extremely important for late medieval philosophers. Aristotle says that being a good person implies a kind of knowledge. While it is virtue that provides us the right end that we aim at, there is also an intellectual capacity called prudence, or in Joe Sachs's translation, practical judgment. Prudence knows how to find the various means towards, uh, towards the end supplied by virtue. It finds them in the mixed and changeable particulars that we happen to find available in front of us in our lives. The ability to provide the means, therefore, must have some limited vision of the goal towards which they are ordered. Hence, it is a kind of knowledge of a fittingness of concrete means to an end. Prudence is a fundamental kind of knowledge and that is closely related to self-knowledge. Uh, and he, uh, Aristotle closes the section saying, one cannot be good in the governing sense without prudence. So, that, um, so you, could have, you can't really have the virtues fully unless they're accompanied by prudence. Um, Aristotle makes some of this clear in a passage which is the one that's important for Dante that's on your handout where Aristotle distinguishes prudence from mere cleverness. This is the sixth passage on your hand. There is a certain faculty which they call cleverness and this enables one to do the things that tend toward whatever tar target has been laid down and to hit it. Now if the target be noble, it is praiseworthy. If it is base, it is knavery. Therefore we call clever both prudent people and knaves but prudence is not the faculty of cleverness merely, though it is not without this faculty. But the habit of prudence comes to be in this eye of the soul, not without moral virtue. For the syllogisms about actions are things having the premise since such and such is the end and the best thing. But this premise is not apparent except to the good man. For vice perverts cleverness and makes it deceived about the premises for action. So that it is manifest that no one is able to be prudent without being good. Notice in this passage, oh, um, sorry. Uh, Aristotle says that prudence implies the awareness of the major premise in the practical syllogism since such and such is the end or best. By this he means that it is awareness of the goal towards which a concrete mean can be directed. Notice in the passage that Aristotle refer refers to prudence in its double, cleverness, which recalls the doubleness of prudence in Plato as a seeing power, both in the darkness and in the light. Plato's shrewd man is potentially Aristotle's clever man. Notice also that Aristotle uses the unusual expression, eye of the soul, that Plato used. This unusual term attested to first in Plato, according to Liddell Scott, is, is, comes up because he's thinking of Plato in this passage, I think. Um, Dante restates Aristotle's point from, in a chapter of the Convivio. The chapter is clearly linked to Ulysses for a few reasons. Um, in this chapter, Dante discusses the proper comportment in old age the age in which prudence is at its height because of long experience. The issue of old age is important in the cantos of the fraudulent counselors of the Inferno. Ulysses and his modern Italian counterpart, Guido da Montefeltro, both tell of their errors in old age. In this chapter of the Convivio, Dante, in fact, discusses Guido da Montefeltro. Finally, uh, there's, in this chapter, there's also a lot of imagery related to ships and navigation that recalls the Ulysses canto. He talks about, uh, at the end of your life, you shouldn't sail into port with your sails up and you should but as you get towards the end of your life, you should pull down the sails and go slow and, and stop with your worldly activities. 
So I'm not going to quote all the relevant things from the convivio to convince you that that's uh, him working out the Ulysses material, but I'll skip it. I'm happy to just take it for granted. Um, trust me. Uh, so he says, uh, I'm just going to quote this passage where he talks about prudence and cleverness. He says, this is the seventh thing on here, uh, a, pr a person ought to be prudent, that is, wise. As Aristotle says in Book 6 of the Ethics, it's impossible for a person to be wise who is not good, from which it follows that anyone who makes his way by subterfuge and deceit does not deserve the name wise. The proper term for him is astute. No one would call a person wise for being expert sticking a dagger into someone's eye. So in general, a person wouldn't call someone wise for having expert knowledge at doing something evil, the very doing of which always inflicts self-injury before it ever injures others. Notice that Dante simplifies Aristotle's claim with a moral emphasis, conflating prudence with wisdom in a way that Aristotle does not. Dante reduces any tension between intellect and morality here. In fact, Dante misquotes Aristotle to the effect that no one can be wise without being good, whereas Aristotle had said that no one can be prudent without being good. Um, however, in Dante's description of the deceitful, astute person, we can sense the Ulyssian figure. We can call Ulysses astute or, or cunning, but not wise or prudent. We can also see in him a case of self-injury and self-deceit, as well as, as the injury of others, which is the thing he says at the end of that quote. Uh, part of this understanding of Aristotle probably comes from Aquinas. According to Aquinas, Aristotle's aim in the ethics at the end of book six and the beginning of book seven is to show that true prudence is inseparable from moral virtue, and conversely, that moral virtue is inseparable from prudence. Hence, it is the nearly complete identity of a moral virtue and an intellectual virtue that both Dante and Aquinas emphasize in their accounts of prudence. For Aquinas, there's a false double for prudence in the cunning use of craft and guile, which he calls carnal prudence. Carnal prudence mistakes low targets for our last end, which should be a vision of God. But it resembles true prudence in that it's good at finding the means to hit those low targets. We're now in a position to see why Ulysses' famous line about pursuing virtue and knowledge is completely unconvincing. Ulysses' claim to pursue virtue and knowledge is false because all of his life he thinks to keep them separate when knowledge loses its value in reality when it's separated from virtue. Such knowledge is like the knowledge of sticking a knife in someone's eye. Ulysses' deceitful behavior in war suggests that he lacks prudence, the hinge between morality and intellect. Ulysses continues to deceive his men, and perhaps himself as well, in his little oration. Dante expects his, reader to be, his readers to be subtle enough to recognize that one cannot trust the stories that the damned tell about themselves. There are many other well-known instances of this in the Inferno in sinners like Paola and Francesca, Pierre de la Vigna, Ugolino, and others. So we have to be able to resist the rhetoric. Note that for Dante, there's nothing particularly Christian about Ulysses' condemnation so, thus far. For Dante, Aristotle and the other pagans in limbo all understand Ulysses to be vicious, not admirable. Certainly the poets that Dante valued the most, Virgil and Statius, viewed Ulysses negatively. Romans te generally tend to do so. Against what some critics have said, Ulysses lacks more than revealed truth. He is not even a good pagan. The danger of mistaking one's own cleverness for true prudence is announced early in the canto in a warning to the reader that stands over the canto as a whole. And this is the eighth thing on your handout. Then I suffered, and now I suffer once more as I direct the mind to what I saw. And I rein in my genius more than usual that it not run where virtue doesn't guide it so that if a good star or something better has given me the good, I might not envy myself of it. This warning about the direction of his intellect tells the reader that the canto will be about the distinction between prudence and cunning that we have been talking about. That is, it tells us that we must beware divorcing knowledge from its guide, virtue. The reference to reining in suggests the movement not of a ship, but of a charioteer, an image which recurs later in the canto in connection with Elijah. St. Bernard called prudence the charioteer of the virtues. And Albert the Great dedicated an article to demonstrating the truth of this saying that prudence was the charioteer of the virtues. So I think that's what's in his mind here. Uh, but these lines of the inferno, above all, underline something 
very close, under, underline the fact that very, some, very, uh, sorry, in, but these lines of the Inferno above all underline that something very close to Dante is at stake. He must use his God-given gifts well. He has the gift of counsel, and he must not withhold it from himself in self-envy. I should also mention that not just his mental gifts, but the writing itself, as the expression of his genius, is suddenly at issue for him, just as the movements of the character in the canto are before our eyes. But this warning about intellect not guided by, vir by moral virtue is more than a matter of Dante protecting his own soul and his literary work from sin. In the passages in the Republic we looked at, both the individual and the community are at risk, and this is also the case here. Dante extends his warning about uh, the problem with prudence to his hometown of Florence implicitly in the very beginning of the canto. This is the next um, thing, this is the ninth thing on the handout. Rejoice, Florence, and this that I'm reading is the very opening of the canto, the first line is kind of backwards. Rejoice, Florence, since you are so great that through sea and through air you beat your wings, and through hell your name spreads. Among the thieves I found five such men, your citizens, that I am ashamed, nor from them do you in great honor rise. But if dreams near morning come true, you will feel, you, you will feel in a short time from now that which Prato, not to say others, wishes on you. This opening of Canto 26 recalls an inscription in Florence written a few decades earlier and still visible today in the Bargello or Palazzo Pubblico. It has a line about Florence's rise to fame and empire through sea and land that resembles a line in Dante's text. And it also has the bombastic tone that Dante parodies here. Here's part of the inscription in, in the, on your handout. Florence is abounding in wealth. She defe uh, defeated her enemies in war and a great rebellion. Or actually my copy might be, I I cut out some of the text in what I gave you. Uh, she enjoys fortune and the distinctions of a powerful citizenry. She feverishly acquires, fortifies, and extends her forts in safety. She rules the land, she rules the sea, she rules the whole world. Thus, by her domination, all of Tuscany becomes happy. Dante's concern about Florence here might remind you of what Socrates says about Athens in the Gorgias. Socrates warns that Athens' ability to build ever stronger walls and an ever bigger navy, creating ever greater revenues, might not be to its advantage. Such expansion might be a sign of sickness or self-ignorance and unrealistic and unjust ambitions and might lead to catastrophic political overreaching. Something similar is at stake with Florence. As Dante tells us, its power is also a sign of its immorality and leads to a political danger of endless civil war as well as wars with neighboring cities who are not so happy at Florentine domination, Florentine domination of Tuscany as the inscription claims they are. Hence, at the end of this passage, Dante predicts the future and prophesizes Florence's suffering in a grievous conflict with Prato, which is either the neighboring town, Prato, or the bishop from Prato, who had condemned Florence uh, officially uh, and uh, cursed it uh, in a ritual curse. Um, so we don't know which of the two events it re refers to. Um, just as Ulysses' mad flight will lead his followers to disaster, so also with Florence's flight. But what does it mean to call Dante a prophet? For Dante, prophecy is not strictly biblical. His idea of prophecy comes as much from Cicero's dream of Scipio and Virgil's eclogues and Aeneid as it does from Kings or Isaiah. The prophet is a wise man with the gift of eloquence and speaks in a way that stirs the human community and its princes to action, sometimes in oratory, sometimes in poetry. Hence, the prophet in the tradition that Dante begins from is a combination of a prudent rhetorician who knows what to say, who to say it to, and how to say it. At the same time, he is a prudent political counselor and a wise man. Dante thinks of these apparently diverse roles as a single thing, the Virgilian Vates from Book Six of the Aeneid, who is instructed in divine providence. For Dante, such a prophet is inseparable from the good of his community. Hence, Dante begins the canto with this address to Florence. In contrast, the deceitful Ulysses is a failed and false prophet and has connection to no real community. So let's see. So uh, Ulysses' speech, which I'm now going to turn to, um, shows uh, in various ways the separation from community. Let me, uh, let me begin with um, 11, the, the 11th thing on the handout. This is the beginning of his speech. When I departed from Kirke, who took from me more than a year near Gaeta, before Aeneas named the place, neither the sweetness for my son, nor piety for my old father, 
nor the love owed to Penelope that should have made her happy could conquer in me the ardor to become expert of the world and of human vices and worth. And I put out on the open high seas. Ulysses so spent a year with Circe, the woman who turns men into animals. This suggests a precise parallel with Aeneas's departure from Dido, which Dante interprets in the Convivio as an allegory for mastering the passions in youth, a traditional reading of Virgil from the Middle Ages. And Ulysses leaving his family behind might be positive, however cold it might seem to us. A medieval theologian once gave the rule for study, stay aloof from kith and kin in order to pursue knowledge. The prophets and the apostles left their family behind. Dante himself lived in exile, although not by choice, and was often away from his family. So staying away from the comforts of one family, one's family can be virtue. In a certain light, this journey could be promising. But Dante emphasizes the negative aspect of Ulysses' departure from kith and kin by saying that Ulysses' desire for worldly experience was stronger than filial duty, the pleasure of fatherhood, and his obligations to his wife, Penelope. Ulysses must not fight just the comfort of home, but his piety and obligations. The lack of piety is particularly damning coming from Virgil, who is the representative of natural reason and at the same time the poet of Pietas. And more importantly than his treatment of his family is Ulysses' disregard for the human community. Ulysses adds details that, be that betray his separation from community when compared with Aeneas. He mentions a geographical detail, that Circe was near a place called Gaeta, and that he stayed there before Aeneas named that place after his wet nurse, wet, wet nurse whose name was Caeta. Dante took the idea of linking Circe and Caeta from Virgil. I won't read it in the interest of time, but the opening 20 lines of Aeneid 7 mention naming, Aeneas naming Gaeta and making a tomb there for her, as well as describe how Aeneas avoided Circe as he sailed from Gaeta to Rome. The moment of the entombment of Caeta, of, of Caeta, juxtaposed with the avoidance of Circe and the arrival in Latium, is the exact midpoint and the precise turning point of the whole of the Aeneid. In these 20 lines that Dante evokes here, Aeneas symbolically puts away the Trojan past for good in the tomb of his Trojan nursemaid, and he pivots towards his future responsibility in Rome, which will be what ha is, occupies him in the next six books. The monument to Caeta is a sign that the past is not to be forgotten. And on the other hand, avoiding Circe and traveling to Latium shows that his continued sense of duty to a community. There he will marry Lavinia so as to found Rome, and as a pious father will seek glory for his son, Iulius. His family is submitted to his obligations to a larger community. And in his case, all this is part of divine providence for Dante, since God sees, oversees the founding of Rome, ironically beginning from the moment when Ulysses overthrew Troy. That's in, in the canto he mentions that overthrowing Troy with the Trojan horse is what gets Aeneas on his way to found Rome. Um, in contrast to Aeneas, after Ulysses leaves his animal passions with Circe behind, he merely goes sightseeing. Compared to Aeneas, he lacks any instinct of social duty and he founds nothing. He is for himself. He neither thinks back to the past community at home in, Ith in Ithaca, nor founds a new community for the future. When we look closely at Dante's phrasing, we see that Ulysses' desire for knowledge is ambiguous. Ulysses wants to become expert in the world and of human vices and of worth. But what is the value of intellectual virtue about morality without any moral virtue? From his use of deceitful tactics, he already seems to be expert in the world. His kind of worldly knowledge is exactly his problem. It is neither wisdom nor prudence. He has developed and mastered expert techniques in dissimulating which was something like sticking a knife into the eye. But he has no wisdom that would tell him how to use the techniques. And even if we thought it was a good to possess such techniques, where would he use them? In the service of what community would he do so? We see no suggestion that he ever found much human worth or had any real reason to search for it in the first place. Ulysses never stops anywhere on his voyage. He just wants to see more and move on to the next thing. After seeing it all, he heads for what he calls the land without people. At the pillars of Hercules, now a very old man, Ulysses wants to sail on. It is the prime moment of fraudulent counsel because it is here that Ulysses makes his deceptive speech and shows the power of his rhetoric. Dante said in the Convivio that having reached the edge of death, 
one should pull in the sails and think of God and the next life. Instead, Ulysses calls his men to sail on. And um, uh, I guess I'll read briefly the, the speech that he gives again, just so you know, but uh, this is the second thing in your handwriting. Oh, brothers, I said, who through a hundred thousand dangers have reached the West, for this so little wakefulness that to our senses remains, don't willful deny experience behind the sun of the world without people. Consider your seed. You were not made to live as brutes, but to follow virtue and knowledge. So let me point out some reasons for my suspicion of the speech. Given the questions we might have about Ulysses as community-minded, uh, the phrase, oh, brothers, is dubious. These are merely the few men who wouldn't desert him after he had led them to the loss of their humanity for a year with Kirka, the motley crew who wanted to continue to avoid facing their duties at home. And the phrase, um, this is a mistake on the hand that I, uh, in an earlier point, I translated it, wakefulness of the senses, because I thought it sounded more lively, but I realized that more literal translation is better. Uh, vigil of the senses is really what I should have written. Um, the phrase is really vigil of the senses, vigil de los senses. Um, and this phrase, vid, uh, vigil of the senses, is an odd way to refer to the time remaining in human life in which one can pursue knowledge. He could have just said, the time left to us, or something like that. But in referring to the senses, he recalls the most common medieval thought about the limits of human knowledge when compared with that given by grace, namely that we can't get complete spiritual truth beginning from the senses. On the other hand, the word vigil is what I realize is maybe more telling because uh, vigil in Italian, uh, this word vigilia, is the word you use for uh, the four important festivals. So Christmas Eve is vigilia di Natale. So the eve of Christmas, Christmas. So the way to translate this would be the, um, the eve of the senses. It's a little confusing, but that's what he's saying, the eve of the senses. So there's implied the fact that there's a day to come. It's the, um, not just the ending time, or the, but the, the night before something. So he just wants to say something like the remaining wakefulness of our senses, but his own language betrays him, and he says, uh, he implies that there's a day coming uh, beyond the senses. But Ulysses doesn't think to prepare for a next life. Instead, he tries to see the other world in this life by traveling to it with his own power. Of course, the sin here is not to explore the world beyond the Mediterranean. This is not a canto against sea exploration. It is what the journey represents allegorically that we need to clarify. I suggest it is a desire to conquer death, going beyond the sun and to find salvation in merely human power. Such a desire to conquer death makes him proudly shake a fist at the limits of human nature and the limits of divine command allegorically represented in the pillars of Hercules. It is also a final and an even more complete break with the human community, a voyage to the land without people. The desire to see God's eternal reality is, of course, not sin. This is exactly what Dante's goal is, and this is why his destination is the very same mountain that Ulysses will attempt to reach. As Adam says in the parallel canto in Paradiso, the sin of Ulysses is not tasting the tree of knowledge. The sin is proud disobedience of a command that he stop in the human world. This is uh, uh, the limit of morality, community, and Allegorically, the exploration beyond the pillars signifies a desire for knowledge of the spiritual realm by human alone, unaided by, uh, by grace. Because such an exploration is motivated by pride that would make us equal to God, it is a sin. It mistakes the vertical ascent to divine truth for a merely horizontal earthly progress. Ulysses describes his last journey as follows. This is the 12th thing on your hand. We turn the back of the ship to mourning making win wings of the oars for the mad flight, always acquiring on the left side. Um, I saw in the night all the stars of the other poles, an hour so low that it didn't rise above the marine soil. Five times was lit, and so many times was spent the light under the moon since we had entered the high pass, when there appeared to us a mountain brown in the distance, and it appeared to me that I had never seen any so high. We were cheered, and suddenly it turned to grief, for from the new earth a whirlwind was born and struck the front of the ship. Three times it made all the water spin, 
and the fourth time it sent the back of the ship up and the prow down as pleased another until the sea was closed above us. That's the end of the thing. What Ulysses is saying is that they sailed for five months southwest and that the North Pole was not visible. His images are of the night. They sail away from morning by moon, not by sun. He also suggests that what he intended as an ascent was just a movement on a horizontal axis. His sense of up and down, of the difference between vertical and horizontal, are utterly confused. While he speaks of high and low, he never leaves the surface of the ocean. He speaks as if the stars of the North Pole are under the, the, under the water, or more li- literally, under the, the ground, but in reality he is merely moving along the curve of the Earth. He mistakenly describes the stars as below him, when in reality he will soon die with the sea above him. When he comes to the mountain, higher than any had ever, he had ever seen, he is destroyed by it. He is not prepared for true height. He does not understand the vertical axis of the mountain and the whirlwind, which sometimes sweeps the prophet up to heaven in a chariot of fire, as the description of Elijah earlier in the canto recalled for us. This same whirlwind can also send us to our doom below. So um, I'm, for the sake of time, I'm cutting out a whole uh, account of up and down in the canto. There's this, this issue of up and down that appears in these lines is there from the beginning. It's in the Florence section, it's in the Elijah, Elijah section, and it's other places in between. In Ulysses' journey, we discover a new side to Ulysses that we might not have expected from his deceit in war. A curious desire for endless experience is discussed in Augustine's Confessions in Book 10 as part of his reflection on the meaning of rhetoric in his own book. Curiosity is a vice for Augustine because it is a mistaking of a means for an end, mistaking the truth of a part for a whole, and desiring knowledge for the thrill or for mastery rather than than for any saving good in it. Some of this is in Dante, too, But I suggest that Dante's understanding of curiosity and the connection he makes to political deceit suggests another source for his thought, which I have so far not mentioned, and that is his teacher, Brunetto Latini, whom we met in Inferno 15, he's among the sodomites. In Brunetto's encyclopedia, called the Tresor, he described prudence as a mean between extremes of desire for knowledge and intellectual laziness. This was a wholly non-Aristotelian account of prudence, since in Aristotle only moral virtues are means, not intellectual ones, it derived from a passage where Cicero points out that it's bad to be too easily persuaded, um, but also bad to be too stubborn before a good argument. From this, Latini comes to see prudence as the right amount of desire for knowledge. In any case, strangely enough, the result of this is that the vice of curiosity for Brunetto turns out to be essentially a danger of prudence. He speaks of curiosity as derived from prudence, comparing it to the Trojan horse, an evil that looks on the outside like a symbol of the goddess of wisdom, but is really destruction. Um, I'll quote only part of this um, stuff from Brunetto Latini. It's uh, on your handout. Be on guard against all extremes. Do not desire prudence inordinately. Do not know more than what is appropriate, but know as much as is sufficient for you. Similarly, guard against ignorance. Be careful not to examine what is forbidden to us. If prudence goes beyond limits, you will be considered to be deceitful with frightful cleverness. It is excessive prudence which leads people to these bad things. Therefore, one must proceed with moderation so that one is neither too arrogant and intellectually lazy nor too clever. Um, So I'm only giving you a little piece. This is a very long account of prudence and curiosity. Uh, One can miss the mean by being too careless and imprudent but one can also be excessively prudent, too careful. It is a little confusing that he speaks of being excessive in a mean, but whatever we may think of his mangling of Aristotle's notion of prudence, I suggest that Brunetto's concept of the vice is very relevant for Dante's text, for understanding Ulysses, and also has some insights as an account of curiosity. Ulysses is both a deceitful political counselor and a curious explorer. His prudence is, in Latini's view, at the root of both of these activities. In fact, in Brunetto's account of prudence, he includes various chapters on the prudence specific to the orator, not to Ulysses. It is prudence that tells the orator who to speak to, when, how, and so on, about what. Hence, just as in in Dante, for Latini, prudence oversees both scientific impulses as well as political rhetoric. The vice of the one suggests the vice of the other. 
In addition to being useful for understanding the details of this canto, Latini's idea of curiosity as excessive prudence implies a real insight. It is similar to a well-known account of curiosity in Heidegger's Being in Time. There, curiosity derives from the activity of umsicht, which is actu usually translated as circumspection, but which is sometimes translated as well as prudence. Um, not in Heidegger, but the word can mean prudence. Um, as Heidegger explains it, circumspection always looks around for things to help us in the world. Unfortunately, it may keep doing that even when all our needs are met. Our mind just won't turn off when, we, when we, our needs are met, we don't need to go looking around for things. Our circumspection may keep looking for ways to manipulate objects and will continue to try to provide for us and investigate what is around us for no reason at all. The impetus of useless provision creates curiosity that restlessly runs over the surfaces of things and finds itself everywhere and nowhere. For the medievals, that an excess of prudence is the same as curiosity means something similar. One can be unnecessarily and excessively focused on worldly cleverness, too focused on learning how to overcome every earthly obstacle, and too focused on earthly ideas of infinite security, wealth, power, and prestige. Um, misdirected practical circumspection is essentially tied to a misdirected desire to know. Ulysses is connected with no community and pursues the knowledge of a circumspect leader of a community without ever having an opportunity to use it. Hence, the curiosity issue pointed uh, Dante to a concern for a political danger and not just the traditional Christian idea of curiosity as theoretical excess. When the waters close above Ulysses' head at the end of the canto, an inverted world has been set right again. The wings that were oars are oars again, and the sea passage that seemed high is now seen to have been no ascent at all, but merely horizontal or even a descent. To Ulysses, the reversal of perspective is of no use because for him it's too late. But for Dante and for his readers, the reversal is intended to educate. The same thing happens in the inferno as a whole. Dante's travel in hell is always downwards. But when Dante exits hell, he climbs to the center of the earth. At that point, Virgil turns around and seems to go back the other way. Dante thinks he is returning to hell. But what he thought was his climb down to Satan was really part of his way up to God. As with Ulysses, when sin is understood, high and low reverse themselves. I'd like to close with a more general thought outside of Dante for a second. Um, Ulysses has often been taken for, as a figure for modernity crouching at the door. And indeed, he resembles Columbus, Machiavelli, Bacon, and Galileo in various ways. What I hope is clear is that what makes such modernity troubling is not simply the old idea of curiosity that simply wants to know what is too high for it or what is forbidden, although it includes this idea. It is a curiosity identical with an excess of prudence, always looking for techniques to evade everything, not only the limits of knowledge, but even mortality and community. This curiosity implies a new individualism that rejects dependence on and obligation to a community and, of, and we are right to be suspicious of. Dante's hesitation before such a connection between knowledge and power was prescient indeed. Thank you. <laughs>